Mindfulness is, is basically just like going to the gym, but for your brain. That's how I see it. Doesn't need to be a religious connotation. Episode 81. Hello, my name is Ryan Willard, and I am the host of the Business of Architecture UK. And this week, I'm speaking with Ben Channon, who is an associate at Asao Architecture, where he has worked since 2012. He's uh, the mental well-being ambassador of the practice, which has won a number of awards for its approach to staff and its care of their staff. He's an accredited mindfulness practitioner with the Mindfulness Association and recently qualified as a well-accredited professional. His Twitter handle, I think, is also um, the Mindful Architect. Um, Ben also founded and chairs the Architects Mental Wellbeing Forum, which is focused on improving mental health within the industry. And he's lectured on wellbeing and architecture at Liverpool and Edinburgh universities. And he also gave a TED talk on the subject in 2018. And he frequently speaks to businesses and public bodies about the importance of this topic, which is what we discuss in this interview. Um, It was also worth noting Ben was selected as the uh, RIBAJ rising star in 2018 and really is a trailblazer um, for his work in architecture uh, and mental health. So sit back, relax and enjoy the mindful architect that is Ben Channon. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work. But it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and I'm here in the lovely Grosvenor Hotel in Victoria with the mindful architect, Ben Channon, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for a lovely introduction. <laughs> Absolute kind. pleasure to be talking with you. And I've been watching your, your TED Talks and some of the advocacy work that you've been doing for mental well-being. I understand you're the ambassador at a sale uh, for mental health. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah mental well-being ambassador, yeah. And, um, and, you, and you've recently written a book. Yeah, it came out uh, in October last year through Reba Publishing, um, Happy by Design. Get the plug out of the way. Amazing. Um, yeah, just about how we as architects um, or people designing the built environment can create homes, buildings that have a positive impact on people's happiness and their mental well-being. And I, I think it's a really, like, one of the most important topics to discuss in entrepreneurship, in business, in architecture, is the mental well-being and mental hygiene of us as individuals, as practitioners. And it's something that's obviously it's come into light more and more in contemporary society, people are having the tools to talk about it, uh, and it's something that will affect most people. And architecture has, in many ways, you know, we there's there's lots of issues, shall we say, or you know, we've not had the best track record uh, for mental well-being for either staff or even students, for example. So how did how did you how did this niche area or this passion of yours begin? Um, well, just rewinding a little bit, I, I think firstly it is important to make sure we, we don't paint a kind of picture of all doom and gloom. Um, you know, uh, it's not like every architect out there is uh, on the brink of a mental health collapse. Um, but yeah, personally for me, uh, I did experience some problems with my mental health um, when I was in my mid 20s. And uh, I've talked about it a lot, as you say, kind of in my TED talk. And whenever I speak publicly now, it's something I try to be very open and frank about because uh, I think it's really important that. Um, anyone who's gone through that process does speak up about it. For mm. me, it was it was anxiety primarily. Um, 
I was just, I had some very unhealthy uh, thought patterns, you know, spiraling thoughts that I found it very, very hard to switch off when I was finishing work at the end of the day. And from speaking to a lot of other architects, it's, it's quite a common problem. Um, you know, we work in an industry where we're trained to be absolute perfectionists um, and, you know, for, with good reason to a certain extent. Um, the, the drawings we produce end up getting turned into real buildings that hopefully will be there for decades, if not hundreds of years. So, you know, that attention to detail and that perfectionism, that there's a reason it's there. But at the same time, um, it, it can weigh very heavily on people. And um, I think also within the architectural education system, there's there's a real uh, pressure on to, to be to be the very best. And I certainly know I put that, a lot of pressure on myself to, to be the very best that I could be. Um, and while there's obviously nothing wrong in, in trying to be successful and trying to do your best, I think um, one thing it's very easy for people to lose sight of in, in any discipline uh, is kind of when, when that stops being um, you know, a good goal and, and shifts to actually being a bit of an obsession or something that you, you really, um, you're, you're starting to sacrifice things like quality of life uh, to, mm. to achieve that success, yeah. And when and so, so from your sort of perspective, what what has a lot of the advocacy work that you've been engaging in involve? Um, so as I said, trying to uh, share my story with a lot with a lot of people, I think is really important. And for me, a big a big thing is that uh, people who have experienced this open up about it. Particularly, I, what I would like to see is more senior figures in architecture. Um, opening up about it obviously not if they don't feel comfortable but people who do feel comfortable talking about um, difficult times they've had I think uh, you know all the evidence shows that the more we talk about this problem the the better the better it is the better we get at dealing with it the easier it is for everybody to, to talk about it as well um, we uh, my my boss John Asale and I uh, co-founded a group in 2017 called the Architects Mental Wellbeing Forum and uh, the idea behind that really was to bring together some of the uh, a group of employers, AJ100 practices, as well as a couple of smaller practices, um, who were all kind of renowned for the way that they looked after their staff. Mm. So whether they'd won uh, the AJ Best Employer Award or you know received awards for for staff care, um, trying to get some of those guys together in a room and um, really explore what was working in our practices, what wasn't working. Um, what really were the root causes of, of a lot of uh, negative mental health problems as well. And um, it's been, so we've been going for a couple of years now, and um, it, it, it's been tough in a way because um, really we're reliant on, we're, we're, not, we're not even a, char a registered charity. It's, it's basically a very well-meaning group of people who are very passionate about this subject and want to improve it. Um, but we launched our first toolkit earlier this year, which is um, a guide for both architectural employers and architects themselves. Uh, which it contains information, resources, and advice as to how to better care for their own and their staff's mental health and well-being. So, uh, yeah, it's been really well received, and it's, what, it feels like you know we're we're starting to make an impact in the world of architecture. What, which is so, fantastic. what sort of things are in those toolkits? So, we broke it down into kind of a series of uh, of topics. Um, so, you know, from things as um, as simple as educating staff, how, how you how you can educate staff to have a better understanding of mental health, right through to more complex issues like the nature of contracts, contractual relationships with clients and the way that they might impact on, on staff's uh, mental health. It might not be the first thing that jumps out at you, but um, you know, I, I believe that when, when we're writing contracts and we're, we're entering into legal agreements with clients, um, that's instantly starting to impact um, the resourcing of projects, uh, the amount of time that teams are having to dedicate to it. And those client relationships, you know, just having the ability to say to a client, actually, um, this deadline isn't realistic, the, that's, that's incredibly powerful. And if you, have a, if you have a good relationship with a client where they, they understand that and they actually treat you as you know a team of human beings which at the end of the day we're architects but we're also human beings and having uh having that strong relationship can really then help your team uh, we, we believe um in you know having a good work-life balance and actually saying um you know what it's 6 p.m i have a family and uh this this deadline maybe isn't as quite as important as we all think it might be so and and for students i mean what is your take then on mental health at university because this is this is um, I, mean, I remember when I was at the the Bartlett we had uh, you know we had a, a, a mental health professional at the beginning of the year come in and and talk to us and it was it was very needed it was kind of it was a very well it was very welcomed um, why do students have or experience 
issues or problems or how is the best way to frame that as well? Yeah, I, I, so I suppose really the question is why, why are we seeing that so much? Why, why do we think we're seeing that so much in students? And um, firstly, I, I should point out that we, uh, at the forum, we definitely sort of set our, um, our stall out as being there to support businesses. And we're all, we're all really involved in the world of business, not so much the world of academia. Right. But what, I, I think what's important to say as well is that um, across all degrees, um, a whole range of degrees, we're seeing problems with student mental health. And when you think about it, it's probably not that surprising. Um, it's a time of huge change and upheaval. For a lot of people, it's the first time they've ever lived away from home. So chances are there's issues like homesickness, missing family at play immediately. It's also a time in your life where you're really trying to work out who you are. You know, you're, mm. you're suddenly, um, you, you're, you've set down this path and you're kind of told, right, this is your degree and this is the profession you've probably chosen for the rest of your life. You've got to kind of try and work out if that's actually for you and work out, you know, what your, what your moral stance is on the world as well. And all of that is bound to, you know, lead people to have quite a confusing time in, inside their own heads, really. You couple that then with um, some of the more unique challenges that, that architecture throws at you. Like I mentioned, issues like perfectionism. We know we know there's a culture of all-nighters, late nights and uh, in architecture schools, a lot of schools, and, um, you know, a lack of sleep, poor sleep is very, very, that is intrinsically linked with poor mental health. So I think when you put it all together, it's just a little bit of a... Um, a, a dangerous cocktail really um, and I think it's also important to say that um, you know there's there's loads of universities out there who are doing great things to, to look after student uh, health I, I, and mental health I don't think it's a case of um, you know universities um, not wanting to help um, but as I said it's it's a, it's a really tough time in people's lives as, as well on top of all the work mm. and it's it's interesting um, I'm just you know recount my sort of experiences at university how you know the Bartlett did a lot in order to kind of stop unhealthy work practices of the students. And it was almost like you couldn't stop us. Like we were determined to work late. We were determined to, you know, people would, you know, they used to close the, uh, the university down at 10 o'clock and everyone had to leave the studios and people would sneak in underneath the, the tables and wait for the lights to be turned off and the cleaner to leave and then come back out and late. And it was like, that's got nothing to do with the university. That's the sort of... Where, where does that yeah, come that, from? And that's, that's really that. ex exactly my point. That um, as as much as maybe uh, tutors and heads of year want to really want to improve the situation, you're right. There's a cultural thing there, and I don't know where it comes from. Maybe it's just that it gets passed down from from the third years to the second years, and then the incoming freshers, and and that cycle just continues and continues. Um, but there's certainly something we identified within within the forum. There's this kind of almost macho culture of like uh, and by macho I don't necessarily mean male driven but I mean this culture of um, I'm you know I must do more hours than you I must stay in the studio later than you and it is very competitive I think the fact that we get students to pin up their work next to each other in the halls and kind of critique them in front of all their mates side by side is uh, potentially may contribute to that um, but uh, I don't know I suppose you'd, you'd need to do some sort of detailed research into that but to me uh, that certainly seems to stand out as one of one of the things I, I've taken away from my experience of university. Um, seeing people go through tough criticism, it's, it's, it's difficult for anyone to take criticism anyway. Mm. But as an 18-year-old in front of a group of your own peers, um, yeah, that that's obviously going to bring with it its own set of issues as well. I think. What would your response be to somebody who might say, or uh, you know, toughen up? Uh, yeah, it's an it's a really interesting one, and. Um, uh, it's like anything. It's it, there's many shades of grey to the argument. Um, I, I, I've heard uh, I've heard older architectural professionals in the past, uh, not that I've worked with, but uh, in, uh, in in conversations, saying uh, they do think this group of youngsters coming through now is is less resilient than they were, and they just had to kind of toughen up and get through it. But at the same time, uh, I, there's, well, there's also the argument that rates of mental health are on the rise, or they seem to be on the rise. But actually, uh, I personally feel that probably the mental health hasn't got any worse necessarily than it always has been. It's just that now, actually, people are more prepared to open up and talk about it. And mm. um, the fact that we're actually we are generally seeing suicide rates coming down in society uh, means um, while we're seeing rates of mental alleged rates of mental health problems go up to me that suggests that actually rather than you know um, doing something really tragic taking their own lives people are actually opening up and talking about it and and that's a really positive thing so i would say that 
telling someone to go away and toughen up or, uh, you know, man up is the other phrase we hear. Um, from a pure sort of mental health point of view, that's probably the worst thing you could tell someone. The, the yeah. best thing you can do is actually admit when you're struggling and, and talk openly about it. And I've certainly found by talking openly about the difficulties I had in my in my mid-20s that uh, rather than sort of tell, tell me I should have toughened up or, or been more resilient, people have actually been really... Uh, kind and mm. actually opened up and shared a lot of their own experiences and as soon as you do that I think people start to realize just how common it is and just you know at one in four people every year they say has a problem with their mental health and uh, by talking about it more we can we can improve the situation mm. for everybody and as and as you say it's actually that real human strength is in being able to be vulnerable it is and I also believe that we've like evolved sharing your vulnerabilities in that, in that yeah, sense yeah op- opening up sharing vulnerabilities but we, we've evolved to be community animals at the end of the day um, it's you know we, we we need community we need support networks and actually by opening up you that's the moment when you realise how much of a community and a support network you have around you which is so interesting to mm. me and and how would you what kind of things do you advise uh, employers to do in into in like looking after their teams and also for individuals who are working just to be able to take stock of where they are you know in their own in their own headspace because this is something that often you know, we don't re- we don't realize that we're the pressures that we're putting ourselves under yeah. and that we end up just kind of normalizing like m- feelings of d- being down and like we end up doing other sorts of activities to try and to sort of numb it out. We do. And we, we also, I think uh, we're very good at normalizing cultures just as human beings, not, not just architects. And uh, yeah, it's very easy to, for a culture to creep in uh, no, through nobody's fault and no nastiness, no intention, uh, but a culture where all of a sudden you just find the whole team stays there till eight o'clock at night, every night. And mm. actually you st- one of the one of the things I I always try and do now is once it gets to six p.m. Always say to myself, "Do I need to be here?" And most of the time, when you ask yourself that question, you actually realise, you know, what I probably don't need to. What am I actually going to get done? I know my productivity rates are going to drop off as it gets into the evening because get everybody's do, generally. Um, and and so one of the things we we try to encourage practices to do is is kind of have a look at that culture. Is there a culture of of late hours working? And um, some of the some of the practices that are involved in the forum even go as far as um, a senior director will go around at the end of the day at you know quarter to six and say, "What are you working on? Do you need to be here? Could you go home?" And just that little you know it's not a telling off, um, it's not babysitting or anything like that, but it's it's just a little reminder that unless you really need to be here. Um, you, you shouldn't be you know doing unnecessary overtime that I know in a lot of practices you don't get paid for we're, we're very lucky at a sale actually um, the policy has always been to pay for overtime provided it's necessary yeah uh, and I think that's an important thing as well it's important to uh, distinguish between overtime that's really important um, and you know we all have it that's the nature of architecture and the construction industry you're bound to have periods of time where you do have difficult deadlines um, and in that instance absolutely I, I believe you, we, we should pay staff overtime because they're giving up their personal time to be in that office. Um, but at the same time, if, if you're not careful and if you just pay staff blanket overtime after, say, 6 p.m., um, then you can easily find that culture creeping in where people just stay later and later, just thinking, I'll just get a couple of hours extra cash tonight. And so, yeah, it's just about how you frame these things, I think, as well. So there's lots of different ways to, to actually to balance it out. Yeah, well, and I think also every company's different. And you it's, it's really we try to emphasise in the forum that uh, and in the toolkit that, you have to find what's right for you and what's right for your company. There's no one-size-fits-all approach. Yeah. And what kind of audit do you suggest companies to do them when they're going on that kind of inquiry of how to look after their, their teams? What sorts of things... Like, so you mentioned work, working hours. What other sorts of things help create uh, an environment of... So we, we talk about the building environment itself, the office itself, and right. give some advice as to how to create a good workplace. And obviously, uh, I tried to bring in lots of lessons from my book in that. Uh, but even things that you might not necessarily think about. So like technology is something that has a huge impact on, on how we feel, and it, it can have a big negative impact on us, I believe. We now live in a, in a world where we can take our emails with us everywhere. We're constantly getting pinged and buzzed and notified about what's going on in our electronic life. Uh, and yeah, it's... I, I think we all fell into a bit of a trap um, when kind of technology came along, whether it was smartphones, whether it was CAD, uh, whatever it was, where people thought this is going to make our lives easier. 
But if that was the case, we'd all be able to go home at three o'clock every afternoon. Um, you know, if, if computers had really made it easier for us to get our work done, then we wouldn't still be working the same hours we were in the 1970s, you know. So um, all it's done really is um, just raised clients' expectations and our own expectations of how much work we can produce uh, in, in a 40-hour week. Um, and so actually... In a weird way, it hasn't made our lives any easier. And with it, it's brought loads of extra stresses, the ability to take work home with us, and also a real lack of control. You know, um, with, a, with a drawing board, you have a certain, la- a certain amount of control, but with a computer, it can crash on you at any time. You can, you can lose a day's work uh, just out of nowhere. And you've got, kind of got that constant uncertainty. And uh, <laughs> it's certainly for any of us who've struggled with you know, losing CAD work over the years. It's, it's such a I'm so glad horrible you're saying feeling. It's, it's, it's a horrible I'm, feeling. I'm just, I'm just thinking of all the, the, like the, the moments when I do lose my temper, normally over inanimate objects and it's normally over like the CAD timing out or something like that. Yeah, but it's, it all goes back to control and that's it's something I've wrote about in the book and we, we need buildings that empower us and give us control. And right. In a way, we, in our lives, like humans, we crave control. We need, like that's one of the things that makes us feel safe is having control over our environment and, I actually think that the more removed we become from our drawings, you know, the more layers of technology we put in between us and our drawings, kind of the less control we have because we're so beholden to the power of the computer. Yeah. And so what's your work with mindfulness then? What is what is mindfulness? You you it's a kind of uh, the title that I've I've really love of yours, the mind for the mindful architect. Um, what is what does that mean? So Uh, I started meditating um, off the back of my problems with anxiety uh, and it was actually something that my GP funnily enough recommended I I do and apparently they're recommending it more and more now but I think you know whenever that was six seven years ago now that was kind of quite a revolutionary thing for a GP to say go away and meditate Um, so uh, I went away and started meditating or well basically closing my eyes and getting very frustrated for a while um but then you know stuck at it and like anything it's like if you've never jogged before in your life you're going to go out and the first run is going to be absolute hell um you're going to probably run a half a mile and want to collapse and that's how i felt meditating you know two three minutes of just trying to sit there with my eyes closed particularly when i was kind of having already having these problems with racing thoughts for me that was that was torture mm. but slowly but surely i built upon it and built upon it and you know got to the stage where i could meditate for much longer periods of time and what, what that allowed me to do really was kind of um, step back from my thoughts a little bit and step away from those unhealthy thought patterns and also identify when, when those kind of juicy thoughts were coming along that I wanted to, to latch onto. So it may be, for me, it was maybe I'd worry about something I'd said in a meeting or uh, about a deadline that I thought we might not hit. Um, and it seems really stupid looking back at it now, but um, at the time... It actually took for me to read in, in a book on mindfulness the, the idea that worrying about that deadline isn't going to isn't going to fix it. It's not going to make that deadline go away. It's it's the only person that was suffering from worrying is me. Mm. Um, and basically, what I was doing was sort of self-inflicting a bit of pain and misery on myself that was having actually no productive benefit to my career or you know my all my life. And is this something that you recommend? architects to be taking up or is this a practice that can be introduced into the workplace or are there exercises that can be easily adopted or is it a kind of monastic activity that's needed or well no it absolutely isn't a monastic activity and i'm uh i'm sorry mum i'm an atheist (laughs) uh, despite my mum's best attempts to take me to sunday school as a child i i'm I'm a pretty non-religious person now um and i don't think you need to have um, Buddhist or Hindu beliefs to get into meditation at all. Um, for me, it's more about um, the ability to really improve your concentration, your focus, especially in a world where um, our mobile phones are now being demonstrated to shorten our attention span and, and it damaged our focus. Um, for me, yeah, I, I think a lot of people, uh, probably myself included, are, are losing our ability to sit down turn off all distractions and work for even you know an hour straight i I question most people to say unless they're incredibly disciplined with turning off phones and emails when was the last time you sat down and just cracked on working Mm. for an hour straight without looking at your phone without looking at an email or opening up bbc news or something and it we're so bombarded with information now that i think um having that ability to to improve your focus and concentration can be very powerful and that's something Mindfulness is, is basically just like going to the gym, but for your brain. That's how I see it. Mm. It doesn't need to be a religious connotation to it. it, no. it it's really interesting that you, what you say about distraction and how you know we are constantly bombarded by 
advertising, notifications, you know, all the sort of social media technology. I mean, I've struggled this with my, myself, the addictive nature of like wanting to check on messages and posts and see how things are doing. And it's kind of compulsive. And like, if you allow yourself to get kind of saturated with that, your ability to dwell in any kind of concentrated thought diminishes. And that has a real like a loss of power. There's a, there's a kind of like, it can erode at your sort of sense of completeness in yeah, a way. Yeah, I suppose like any like any addiction really, I'm, I'm not an expert on addiction, I don't know lots about it, but to me, yeah, the idea of being beholden to anything, mm. reliant on anything uh, beyond myself is, it, it's not a pleasant one. Um, and certainly the idea of kind of being addicted to our phones, I think it's something that a lot of us, is kind of snuck up on us and we don't really necessarily realise that we, we do have that kind of need to keep checking it, but yeah, it definitely creeps up on you. Very interesting. Um, and so what's next? Uh, tell, tell me a little bit about your book, actually. Sure. Okay, so um, my book really was uh, born out of partly my experience, uh, you know, having, having problems with anxiety and starting to realize that the world around me was having an impact on how I felt. Um, I, I don't think I'm a particularly... I'm, I'm any more sensitive than any other person to the environment around me. And I started to wonder, you know, does, does everyone feel like this? Does everyone walk into a space with a high ceiling and feel, you know, uh, a sense of freedom? Or does, do other people walk through, you know, um, maybe, you know, a rundown street with uh, graffiti and, and broken windows and, and feel more negative? Um, and I started to question that side of things. Uh, and it was really interesting. I kind of discovered that there's just tons of amazing, fascinating work going on in the worlds of kind of neuroscience, environmental psychology, uh, and yet, as, a, as an architect who I trained for seven years, I'd never really been taught any of that stuff. And for me, that was, that was so interesting because what we're, what we're trying to do ultimately as architects is create great places for people. And yet we're not necessarily, or certainly I wasn't taught uh, necessarily how, how people's minds work and how mm. the environment impacts on, on people's state of mind. So started digging, trying to find books on the subject, couldn't find too much. Um, so I thought, well... I'll put together a design guide for a sale so that you know um, I can help inform my colleagues uh, of the stuff that I'm learning. And it kind of grew and grew and grew. Uh, Reba, Pub Reba Publishing got wind of it. And uh, yeah, they, they, they liked the idea and it, it kind of grew into the book, which was, yeah, it, was, it felt quite organic. It didn't feel like uh, I, something I really, I, I didn't sit down one day and say, I'm going to write a book. It's just something I was genuinely fascinated mm. by and dug into and it kind of formed itself really, yeah. And is there a relationship between individual personal mental well-being and hygiene and our ability to better design spaces for that? Well, I, I think there's probably just uh, more fundamentally than that. There's, there's a key relationship between our own personal mental hygiene and just our ability to do anything. Our, you know, if, um, if I, I describe it to people quite often is every day you wake up and say um, we're all on a sliding scale of, of where we are on any given day uh, in terms of our mental health it's not like we're all every day we're just on the same point it's say it's a scale of one to a hundred and generally it's a bell curve so most of us will probably be somewhere between a 40 and a 60 every day um, but you know you're having a great day maybe you're up at 75 or 80 and you're really thriving everything you do just seems to turn to gold and you're super productive you're really happy and get on well with everybody but then at the same time, a kind of mentally healthy person could also have a really bad day where they slide down to a 30 or a 25 and it is a tough day and you feel low and, you know, things can happen in your life as well that, that contribute to that, you know, family problems or whatever it might be, work problems. Um, so I think when, when you're in, when you're towards the lower end of, of that sliding scale, it becomes much tougher to do anything. Mm -hmm. It becomes tougher to be a good architect or to be a good friend or a, a good partner. Um, so... I think, yeah, it, fundamentally, our kind of mental well-being uh, affects everything we do every single day. And uh, what's also really interesting is how contagious it is um, when people are people are having a bad time. Um, you know, we, 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 we mimic and echo behaviors a lot. And if, if people around us are, are having a tough time, that can often, you know, impact on other people as well. And um, you see it, in, see it in teams at work. I'm sure everyone's seen it where sort of a team starts to um, get a bit, you know, overworked and slowly but surely kind of grinds everybody it grinds everybody down because those pressures of deadlines and it, yeah it can kind of spread quite negatively mm. is there a difference between how men and women deal with mental health um 
I don't. You, that's not something that I've particularly done lots of research into. I, what what I do hear a lot uh, is, uh, and it, again, I would I would want to look this up and, and fact check this. But uh, what I've certainly read in the media and what we hear is that, um, the, or the stereotype certainly is, women talk about their problems a lot more than men do. Um, that would sort of bear out in the evidence of the construction industry. Uh, where tragically um, a, a, a man takes their life every single day in the construction industry. It's now the most dangerous, dangerous industry to work in in the UK, not because of accidents on building sites, which we've actually really managed to reduce, but um, because of the rates of suicides. And um, one of the reasons that's assigned to that is that it's a largely male-dominated industry. Um, mm. And uh, you know we, as men, are much less likely uh, to talk about how, how we feel and as I was saying earlier that just to opening up to someone and and saying that you're having a difficult time can just make make things so much easier um, so I'd say that's probably the, the big difference as far as what I've seen yeah and and is there any advice you would give to people who are listening to other people who are opening up because I, I I would might make an assumption that there's there's an, there's a way to listen and there's a way not to listen. Yeah, there, there absolutely is. And um, again, I'm I'm not a psychiatrist or anything, but uh, having done the mental health first aid course, one of the key points that they they teach in on that course is is to listen really non-judgmentally. Uh, it's not necessarily about trying to give someone the answers or solve their problems because, um, f- firstly, you you very much may not be able to solve their problems. Um, and secondly, that might not be what they necessarily want from you. Um, it's more about really being a good, compassionate human, which is something that I hope you know 99% of us have the ability to do that and, and would do that for a friend or family uh, member. But yeah, it's, it's about really listening to someone, making them feel perfectly safe in, in saying exactly what they think. And saying to someone, I'm having a tough time, can be horrible. Um, mm. It can be a really tough thing for people to do. Um, and and so I think it's about making someone feel completely like you're you're not judging them, and they can say anything that they want, and you will, you will not judge them for that. Mm. And so, what's next for you? Well, interesting question. So um, I've recently qualified as a, a well accredited professional, which is kind of the next direction my career is moving in. Uh, um, I, for me, you know, I spent seven years studying as an architect, and I absolutely want to keep designing buildings. I, I'm really passionate about hanging on to that part of my my career, and so um, spending still the majority of my working week uh, designing buildings, designing master plans. Um, but yeah, alongside that, now um, we're we're looking at a couple of schemes for clients um, in terms of getting them well accredited, which is really fascinating for me. Bringing in the, the physical well-being side of things uh, as well as the, the mental well-being, which mm. is obviously what I focused on for the last couple of years. So feel like now I'm kind of getting more holistic understanding of the whole the whole subject area. Um, thinking maybe about uh, getting onto a second book, but um, it's been it's been a busy year since the book came out, so. Uh, don't know whether I'll find time to squeeze that in or not. Do you know what type of thing that book would be focusing on? Same sort of area, I think. Um, but yeah, not not quite sure yet. Kind of, I'd like to look at a few individual case studies of buildings that are doing this sort of thing really, really well, um, and kind of maybe assess why they're working and what lessons we can learn from them. Amazing, Ben. Thank you so much Thanks, for your Ryan. time this afternoon. Appreciate it. Thanks. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.